Uh, so with that, uh, okay, uh, this is being recorded. Good. Okay. Hmm. Uh, my advance is not working here. I got to stop the shit. Uh, Jack, my, I'm frozen here for some reason. Okay. Start again. Okay. So the Washington Canoe Club sits on the banks of the Potomac River. Uh, the towers of Georgetown University are up behind it. This is at the upper end of Georgetown for those of you who know Washington a little bit. The uh, CNO Canal uh, is behind the club uh, with the road behind that. Uh, the, uh, the club sits within a national park, the CNO Canal National Historic Park. I've been a member for about uh, 30, 30 years now. I put together the book uh, over three years. It was something I wanted to do. To, partly it was just so interesting, it's fun to do. I also wanted to document uh, the history that uh, is so you know unusual i think in the washington area um let's look take this uh photo from the cover and actually look at the full photo uh that uh it was taken from because it's kind of how i want to structure the slideshow tonight um four things i particularly want to talk about one is this uh, wonderful old victorian boathouse we have uh, secondly our relationship to the Potomac River. And you'll see here, for example, on the left of the photo that the club was actually built on piers over the river. This is a picture taken at low, low tide. Mm. And uh, the uh, so you can see under the club, but ordinarily there's water under the club. It's, this is a big regatta day, flags and so on, people well-dressed. Uh, people, there's actually a barge pulled in off to the right where, where um, the audience is watching. You can see different kinds of paddlers uh, in the foreground, a, a recreational group, but on the dock are a couple of guys actually preparing for a race. And the other interesting thing is one very elusive figure in the history of the Canoe Club is a man named Pembroke Smith, a part Indian, part African-American who wandered into the Canoe Club in 1912 and was our steward for 41 years. He's squatting there. I finally figured out that was him squatting, squatting on the deck of the club. Peter, I, uh, just Jane or Peter? I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So, uh, starting with the boathouse, the, the Canoe Club boathouse actually drew its inspiration from the Charles River in Boston. The architect who designed it, uh, George Percival Hales, came from Boston, moved to Washington, and he was very familiar with the wooden shingle. Uh, Victorian style boathouses on the on the Charles. So he brought that to Washington. And this was a sketch he did that appeared in the Washington Post in September of 1905 uh, with a tower and the uh, little cupola on top and the uh, gable, uh, kind of a throwback to uh, Victorian times, even though architectural styles were changing at that point. The Canoe Club today now has two turrets on it, um, long balcony, um, boat sheds all the way across the first floor, uh, additional rooms on the second floor, including um, offices and a, and, a, and a ballroom. This is the interior of the ballroom uh, early on, a uh, wonderful Corbell fireplace, vaulted ceiling, a great place for dances, for dinners, for theatricals, really was the center of canoe club uh, social life uh, for years and years. And just one example, uh, in a cold winter day, sitting around the fire, uh, smoking a cigar, swapping yarns with fellow members. Um, the cases were full of silver trophies that had been won over the years, uh, over 120 years um, of canoe club competition. Today, we are uh, shut out of most of the building. Uh, the National Park Service, who's our landlord, considered it um, unfit for occupancy. They have done a lot of stabilization and buttressing to keep keep it up uh, to keep the walls secure and so on. But um, we actually are not using the ballroom or almost all of the canoe club at, at this point. We're, we're just embarking on a renovation um, of it. But it's still, we have still a very robust uh, 
uh, club uh, activities outside. Um, but you can see in this picture up on the upper right, you can see problems with the shingles and the roof is on, but the roof is leaking. We've got huge amount of work still to do on it. <clears throat> I want you to see this picture of the canoe club and look carefully at the building materials. If you notice, they're actually Lego blocks because <laughs> the greatest compliment a, 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 a architectural ed edifice can have is to be part of Lego land in um, California, along with the Jefferson Memorial and the Lincoln Memorial. And here we are uh, in, in Lego land. Excellent. So turning now to the uh, Potomac River, 1865, looking up river toward the old aqueduct bridge, uh, the first span across the upper river. A uh, great picture of a barge uh, with two horse-drawn buggies coming across the river. The canoe club is going to appear in the kind of upper right part of the, um, of the um, photograph. And here is the earliest picture we have of the canoe club. Uh, 1905, it had been built by our members. Uh, there was an old mill off to the uh, right of it, uh, another mill or warehouse further upstream, a railroad track running along, which really tells some of the history of the club, uh, which was Georgetown in general was an industrial waterfront and the railroad and the mills kind of attest to that. I love this picture too with the uh, sailing sloop in the background. I don't know if that's a uh, commercial vessel or just a recreational one. Uh, 10 years later, the Canoe Club has now uh, expanded some uh, with another turret. You can see Georgetown University is also expanding above us. One, a lot of the images I came up with raised as many questions as they answered. For example, this one, what are all these motor boats out front, these yachts? And because we've always been a Canoe Club. So I asked some of the old timers and they said, well, um, the Canoe Club members had a lot of friends who would like to come to the club and drink. And so they'd come in their launches and have a drink and then take off. So it's, it gives the illusion that we're a motorboat club, but we never, we never were. The, there were some magnificent boathouses along the Potomac in the early years. This is the, uh, one of our neighbors, the Potomac Boat Club in the late 19th century. But there really was never a boathouse row uh, like you've seen or know of on the Schuylkill River in Pennsylvania for a number of reasons. Um, this is really the, this picture is probably the most extensive run of boathouses that we had with the Canoe Club on the left and um, uh, Dempsey's Boathouse uh, in the middle. Uh, just to the right of the bridge, you can see uh, the newer, uh, the current version of the Potomac Boat Club, but partly because Georgetown was really more industrial than recreational, um, there just weren't a whole run of, run of boathouses, uh, except for these, uh, these, these three. I want to turn now to um, what people did during the summer. Commercial and uh, residential air conditioning wasn't developed in the United States until probably the 40s and 50s. To get cool in the hot summer uh, summers of Washington, people went out and camped out along the river in uh, setups like this, or sometimes more formally, this was called the Colonial Camp, which had 16 tents on platforms, uh, very orderly. They had a kitchen tent, uh, wooden floor used as a dance floor. They actually had a Victrola uh, for their uh, Saturday night dances. It was, it was quite, a, quite a nice fancy setup. The men in the families didn't take the summer off. They uh, got in their canoes in the morning, went down, parked their canoes, got on the trolley cars, went to work, uh, came home in the evening and, uh, and put in, after putting in a full work day. So here, here they are relaxing around around the fire in the evening. Um, it was a very social scene, uh, these camps. There were dozens of them, possibly hundreds of them, uh, all up and down the Potomac, uh, probably a couple miles of shoreline in both the DC and Maryland sides and also the Virginia sides. Lots of activity, horse play uh, among the young people who had the days when they weren't going to work, learning to paddle and just fooling around. So it was, I mean, it was kind of a, I don't know, I idealize it as kind of idyllic scene along the river. This guy has it on a 1913 shirt, I don't know. This, 
one of the things I noticed in this picture was as a child with what looks to be a um, iPad or or a um, an early version of the uh, of a, a heavy of book a tablet maybe. So now the, the Potomac though, when you're on a river like the Potomac, all is not tranquil and comfortable because Potomac mother has uh, faced Mother Nature's fury many times. Valentine's Day, 1918, there's a huge ice block which uh, blocked up the river, uh, completely tore apart. Our neighbor Dempsey's boathouse had to be completely rebuilt. The canoe club you can see in, uh, on the upper left has ice blocks piled up all the way up to the windows, but somehow miraculously survived this one. We've also had enormous uh, raging floods. Uh, this one in 1936, this is, for those of you from Washington, this is looking across chain bridge from the Virginia shore. This bridge has been replaced by another chain bridge, but it was at that height. So it's a very uh, enormous flood that did extensive damage up and down the river. This was one of our neighbors, um, Warner's Boathouse that got, was a total loss after the flood. Uh, <clears throat> The docks of the Washington Canoe Club were kind of a wreckage and debris. Uh, the Canoe Club, however, survived as it has survived for 120 years. A couple of reasons for that, we think. One of them is just the construction. Of the, of the first floor is basically boat storage with uh, piers. And when a flood comes through, it washes through the club. Sometimes it pull, uh, tears down some walls, as happened here. But after the flood, we Hose, it, hose out the mud and tack the walls back up and we're, we're back in business. There's also, a, there's also a topographic anomaly where we're in a little bit of a bay and the floodwaters eddy out and actually hit us going back upstream. So that, that's helped save the club over time as well. But the floods continue, 1996, actually that year we had two uh, of these floods that flooded all the way up to the second floor and uh, the floods, as I've looked at the records, come on roughly a 10-year cycle. We have not had a major flood since 1996, so I'm kind of bracing, bracing for the for the big one at this point. So, uh, with that, I'm, I, I think I'll just take a break and see if there are any questions. How large is the membership? There are about 300 members now. Hilton and, and the uh, it's been interesting that during the pandemic where our membership has been, been growing by leaps and bounds. People are so eager to find a place to get out and um, paddle. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, in the Washington Post article, you said you were quoted as saying that the Potomac was one of the finest urban rivers. Uh, and I wondered why you thought that was the case. Yeah, I, 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 I say, and it's never really been challenged, the, the Potomac River in Washington is the finest urban river in the world. Uh, <clears throat> the reasons I say that, it's uh, clean water, uh, we swim in it. Uh, it, fish can be eaten out of it right here in the urban area. It's got class one to class six whitewater boating as well as wonderful flat water boating and, and rowing facilities, it's got incredible archaeological and historic resources right along it. Uh, it's at the intersection of the Piedmont Plateau and the Atlantic Coastal Plain, so it's got very rare and endangered uh, plant species. And it's just the whole, and it's got basically wild shorelines, Jenny. So for all those reasons, and I won't go into the history of why it didn't get developed the way almost any other urban river did, but that's, that was, that's my argument. Oh, I wish you would go just a little bit into why why that happened well I mean, I mean because i mean we have the anacostia too which is like a disaster right yeah yeah well i mean the the on the on the maryland side we have the cno canal so there really wasn't going to be much development there and there is very steep bluffs on the virginia side so it limited development there and washington was really a, never an industrial city so those are you know yeah some of the simple reasons thanks so much yeah has the Potomac ever been studied as far as damming it? It, it has. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons we have these enormous floods is there are no flood control dams or really no, no flood control conveyances, channelization or dikes or anything 
up and down it. There's one fairly sizable dam way up in the headwaters, which is for emergency water supply. But um, there was there have been proposals. It was a huge proposal in the 1930s to build a dam at what's called Chain Bridge that would have created a um, gosh, probably a 10 or 12 mile uh, lake all the way back to Great Falls uh, for a couple of reasons that was never built. So yes, there have been proposals, but um, uh, it's really unusual in being essentially a free flowing river. Chris, I have a question on um, where the boats are stored. Well, during the, <laughs> in this picture, Brocky, uh, they are either in the ballroom or They've been moved up to the uh, CNO Canal towpath, but ordinarily they're stored on, in the first floor in the uh, boat bays on the first floor. And we also have outdoor racks. Does that answer your question? Well, sort of. It, it's I'm imagining lots of outrigger canoes. You said something about 150 um, stand-up paddle boards. I imagine all different kinds of canoe craft from racing canoes to Grumman aluminum ones like Jack and Hilton would paddle. So, so where are all, how is that access to the river uh, controlled, if any? I can't yeah, imagine I, everybody going down those same ramps. Yeah, well, not everybody's there at the same time. On very busy regatta days, it's where you have to sort of um, draw, draw lots, but 99% of the time, uh, the club is basically underused. Most of the storage, uh, particularly now with the club closed down, is out of outdoors on racks. Some of them have covers, some of them don't. And okay. um, I wish I had a picture, but we have a, um, gee, more than an acre of boat storage. Okay, that answers my question. So, so I'm going to keep going at this point, and we'll, we'll have some more chance for, for questions. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the craft and the, the um, the people who use them. So we're all familiar with birch bark canoes in the beginning, you know, of canoeing in, in North America. Um, this is an example of a re really neat picture I found of a Ojibwe family in a bark canoe, but you can see from the quality of it, I couldn't use it in the book. So I, I found another, but uh, this was, this happened again and again. I, I found a picture I'd really like and then I was unable to use it. But by the late 19th century, uh, canoeing had kind of changed. There was more leisure time. People were in cities. Um, canoe manufacturer changed. Wooden canvas canoes were being built um, uh, all over New England and, and, and parts of Canada. They were relatively affordable. So it, it, it provided new opportunities for, for leisure activity, um, including um, going out for paddles, for courting, uh, you know, some privacy for, for the uh, <laughs> couples who wanted to escape the prying eyes of chaperones. Uh, of course, there were some, uh, some men who wanted to try to take advantage of uh, this situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, by the way, this is, uh, this is not considered safe sex, uh, uh, as any of you who have tried this maneuver um, are, are aware. But, uh, must, be, I, must be a Williams guy. I, I like uh, the this picture is always a little uh, ambiguous to me. I'm not quite sure who the aggressor is here. She looks, uh, she looks very pleased with the situation. <laughs> so uh, paddling became uh, kind of two kinds, single blade paddling, which is what we usually think of as canoeing, and then double blade paddling. People look at this picture and say, oh, there, there, there's a four for a uh, crew for rowing. But in fact, you'll notice that the uh, paddles have uh, double blades on them. So they, they really, were used for you know what we today call kayaking. In both sports are Olympic now Olympic sports. Um, this was um, our first Olympic team in 1924. The Paris uh, Olympics featured canoeing and uh, double, both single and double blade as a demonstration support uh, sport. And the United States sent a team to Paris, and the entire United States team came from the Washington Canoe Club. These four <laughs> gentlemen. And they won all the gold medals and the double blade. The Canadians won, won all the uh, single blade. But uh, that was the beginning of canoeing uh, in, as an Olympic sport and continues to this day. In the 1950s, uh, we developed a very strong single blade paddler, a guy called Frank Havens, uh, who was, um, had, was born. His father was a member of the club. He had been around for a long time. And Frank got so good that in uh, 1952, he won the gold medal at the uh, Helsinki Olympics setting, setting a world record at 
10,000 meters uh, in, this, in this boat. <laughs> one, of, one of the things I was looking for when I was doing the book was finding sort of celebrities to spice it up uh, so people would be interested. So yeah, we got a gold medalist, but that wasn't enough. So Frank Haven's son, who's around, uh, gave me this picture of a presidential luncheon at the White House early in President Eisenhower's term. And uh, there's Ike in the middle and on his, uh, to the left are two baseball hall of famers. And you'll see on the right, um, two familiar faces, Joe DiMaggio and yeah. Rocky Marciano. So I said, yes, this is, this is just what I want for the book. But then Frank Haven's family said, yeah, but Frank's not in the picture. Yeah. So that was, that was a little bit of a setback, but I went to Abilene to the, um, to the Eisenhower Presidential Library and they were absolutely wonderful helping me uh, look at photos and they found another picture of the luncheon and there on the far left in the uh, light suit and the white bucks is Frank Havens, our guy, so great. <laughs> Except Joe DiMaggio has stepped out of the picture. Joe, <laughs> where's Joe? Well, with modern technology, of course you can fix that. And here's Joe in the front row. And now I've got Frank Havens in the very back row of the picture. But my ethical advisors and my publisher said uh, no. So I had to settle for the picture with no. I, Joe DiMaggio lost his opportunity for 15 minutes of fame. Uh, too bad. <laughs> uh, Chris, so uh, there's, a, there's a song about that, isn't there? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. Chris, da, da, da. yes, uh, okay. two two African Americans out of uh, what sixty or something. <laughs> so, 1953 in Washington D.C. Yeah, well, these are all these those two are they're all I mean, all these people are Olympic stars, uh, golfers. Gene Sarenson is in the front row there. Um, mm -hmm. um, I can't remember uh, Braddock. I think is a gold medalist in, in one of the track and field events. There's tennis stars, uh, and, and so on. So, but yeah, not obviously not a lot of African Americans. So I wanted to pause here and see if there are uh, uh, some more questions. Okay, I'm going to keep rolling then. So. Um, one of the other sports that occur, was going on at the club was uh, tilting or jousting, where, you know, take off on the old uh, medieval uh, knights uh, charging each other. And here you had your steed was actually a canoe and you charged each other with these long lances with padded ends and try to knock each other into the water. Uh, great sport, very, very brutal sport, as I'm told. <laughs> so far, I've talked mostly about men in paddling, but one of the things that the uh, club prides itself on is the role we had in getting women into paddling. Not so much this recreational uh, gal early on, but um, serious, uh, serious competitors. Miss Elizabeth Smith, pictured here, uh, was a champion diver and was persuaded to start paddling and very quickly became proficient. And here she's uh, paired with one of our uh, Olympians, Harry Knight, and. Uh, they were a dominant force in, in mixed tandem racing uh, all over the East Coast for a decade or so. A jump ahead 40 years, um, Gloria Ann Perrier came down from Lewiston, Maine, uh, French Canadian. Um, her sports were so softball and bowling, uh, but one of our members discovered her in a bowling alley and she looked very strong and they persuaded her to come down and start paddling and she really changed the sport at the canoe club. She became the national kayak champion. Uh, two years later, uh, she, and she was one of the first women, she was the first contingent of women to go to the Olympics in 1960 in, in, in Rome. Two years later, um, another uh, fine paddler emerged, Francine Fox. Francine was 13 years old and she, uh, she was playing tag on the junior high, uh, on the playground of her junior high school in, Washington and uh, one of her classmates said, Francine, you should come try to paddle. Well, Francine took up paddling and she, she was a phenom. She was national champion in six months beating, beating out Gloria, Gloria Ann Perrier. Uh, the media went crazy over this teenager, uh, cute teenager. And uh, this, I found this uh, page from somebody's scrapbook, but uh, she was just photographed and uh, uh, 
you know, all over the place as she began a racing career. She and Glorianne then paired up and they won a silver medal in the Tokyo Olympics. They're only two of nine Americans ever to win paddling medals or, or flat water paddling medals in the Olympics. Um, this is another example of a picture I'd love to have in the book. I must have spent four hours trying to track down the original this picture so I could use it, but I couldn't. So you get to see it, but it didn't actually appear in the book. Today, women, uh, our women paddlers are very strong, uh, outrigger paddling, marathon racing, uh, sprint kayaking, um, high kneel uh, Olympic canoeing. They're real stars. They travel all over the United States. They go to Hawaii every year and they're, they're um, I don't know their ranking exactly. They may be the best team in the country. We also are bringing on along youth paddlers. Uh, this is one of our uh, young women last year in Czechoslovakia competing in, in Olympic style high kneel canoeing. I wanted to say one more thing about the craft. This is what canoeing looked like 50 or 60 years ago. This is the kind of boat that Frank Havens won the gold medal in. Uh, this was the standard. Today, here's what these racing boats look like. Uh, the guy in the middle in the blue shirt, high kneeling, he's in a 10 inch wide boat. That is now the standard for uh, Olympic high kneel paddling. It's very fast, extremely tippy, but you can see all the boats have gotten narrow. The uh, marathon canoe, well, the marathon canoe on the left isn't that narrow, but the outrigger canoe, the um, surf ski, the black surf ski that says Epic on it. There's a very thin, uh, fast uh, sprint kayak there. So it's just kind of remarkable to see the change in design over the years. And I don't know, they can't get much thinner than 10 inches, I don't think. So uh, I'm going to pause just for a second, see any, any questions here. What is the fellow second on the right in that picture? What is he doing? He's teasing that uh, girl next to him. He, he's in oh, a, okay. Well, that's he, fair. Yeah, he's in a... Uh, you know, he's in a sprint canoe, um, uh, but he, does, he doesn't even need two legs to balance it, apparently. And she, she also is. And he's just, he's just teasing her. So you and don't you have one-legged races. <laughs> 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 uh, the, uh, in the background, you see a stand-up paddleboard, which uh, I haven't talked a lot about in this, this uh, presentation. But that, that's probably the most popular sport at the uh, canoe club now. Canoeing is, oh, third or fourth in popularity compared to... Uh, was she one of our classmates? <laughs> she one of our classmates? No. Chris, yes. I know next to nothing yep. about high knee paddling. Um, it, 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 does the paddler paddle on the same side the whole time? Yes. Yeah, so, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a funny sport, John. It's just, uh, um, well, I, I've never tried it. I would not get caught dead in one of those canoes I wouldn't well I'd be dead I'd be in the water um but it's uh it's extremely fast and those guys they're torquing their body so it's 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 about well it's about the fastest way to propel any boat through the water except a rowing shell and, it, and it's been around for a while it's been yeah it's been around since for 120 years but you yeah. saw the early ones right. uh, you know the uh you know how much fatter they were so they're, they're, right. you know the design has changed a lot these were all right. wood these are now right. of course carbon fiber and and uh, kevlar and so on right. chris um i went to <laughs> high school with francine fox and when she won the medal i think it was 64 or 63 our school went crazy oh imagine having a medal gold medalist or silver medalist uh, walking down the hall. <laughs> so, Richie, awesome. you were you went to Western High School with her? Yes. Oh, cool. That's a great story. Wow. <clears throat> Wonderful. Yeah, she, yeah. she was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, she went on. She had quite a career. She lives in California now, and uh, you know, she's what a year or two younger than us, I guess. So, the, hey, I to talk, yeah, yeah. This is Josh. Yeah, um, Josh. Was, was Jamie McEwen one of yours? He was a student at Landon where I first started teaching. He, he's a whitewater paddler, uh, yeah. Josh. And it's funny, there's very little overlap, really none, between flat water paddling and, and whitewater. I mean, he was a uh, he was a medalist, as you know, in whitewater. But uh, right. uh, no, he wasn't part of the canoe club. Okay. 
Chris, you mentioned that um, stand up, you know, uh, paddle boarding is a big deal. So in Seattle, when you go out to Green Lake, that's what everybody does. It's a huge sport, a huge recreational sport. Is yeah. that is it also a, um, a competition sport? The, it uh, is. Yeah, the gal, the gal in the uh, background, Kathy Summers, um, does whitewater class two whitewater competition. She did a 32 mile marathon race in her uh, stand up paddle board. So wow. they have. Yeah. Yeah. So it is very competitive. But but I'd say 98 percent of our folks do it as a, just recreational. Okay, I'm going to continue continue on here because um, we're, we're we're running on. So I wanted to, the last thing I wanted to talk about was just the um, the Washington Canoe Club as a social entity. In the late 19th century, um, as people began to have more leisure time, uh, um, they began to form social clubs, associations, uh, fraternal organizations. A lot of times built around sports activities. Uh, and uh, one of the things I, I love this picture you can see little two, three little boys who were kind of being brought into the fold by their by their dads I guess um, so the Washington Canoe Club was one of these we merged from that culture in 1904 um, competition was part of our culture uh, from the very start uh, swimming races we had a track team that went to the Penn relays we had a boxing team bowling we had a football team baseball um, I don't really know how these guys ever really had time to go to work. They, they were uh, so, uh, so active in their competitive sports, but very much uh, part of our history. But as the club has also been a wonderful family place for kids to learn about paddling and about river safety and just the joy of being out, out on the river, both in summer and also in winter when the, uh, when the uh, river freezes. We have lots of fun. This back, a ways back race with uh, no paddles. Um, you can see three boys up on a high diving board there. Somebody sailing in the background. One of the one of the interesting things when I found new pictures was dating the pictures. And for example, this one is relatively easy to date because you can see the aqueduct bridge, which has been modified over time with the with the uh, steel superstructure. But behind it, Key Bridge is being built, and there was a period from nineteen. 21 to 1923 when both of those bridges were, were there. So that's the date on this photo. We've been a destination for long distance uh, paddlers from all over the country, from Canada. Here's a Hokulea that sailed in from Honolulu uh, four years ago. Uh, the Hokulea had come, uh, gosh, I've forgotten, 10 or 10, 12,000 miles around Cape of Good Hope, crossed the Atlantic and came to the Washington Canoe Club with great great fanfare. Uh, their crew had alternated off and on, um, but they, they came in. We had a uh, ceremony. The uh, Polynesian Voyager Society greeted them at the dock with uh, songs and uh, blowing on conch shells and uh, dancing. Secretary of the Interior were there, several senators. It was a big, big, big deal for us. The Hokulea uh, stayed at our dock for 10 days. We had probably a thousand visitors um, uh, school children and others who want to learn about what it was like to be out on the open ocean with with no modern equipment at all uh, and also uh, um, just what what was the plight of the world's ocean so it was a it was a really historic time for us to have their visit after they left they sailed back to Hawaii so they circumnavigated the globe they were teaching the crew celestial navigations and other traditional uh, navigational skills we host each year Wounded Warriors. There's a local organization called Team River Runner that brings down folks who have both physical disabilities but also are su suffering emotional wounds down to the club to learn to paddle. We have a uh, biathlon with especially modified kayaks that they can race in. It's tremendously uh, therapeutic and uh, healing for these uh, folks to be getting out on the river. We also play a role sort of as first responders in uh, safety situations. This, uh, this is actually kids learning what to do with a, uh, with a uh, dumped canoe, but we also often have situations where more dire. Virtually all the older members of the club, and including myself, have and been engaged in, in rescues, uh, um, often saving somebody's life. Um, this is absolutely terrible picture, but it came from a newsreel where 
someone had jumped off Key Bridge um, trying to take his life. One of our members saved his life and uh, very dramatic story, which is told in my, in my book. We, we uh, host uh, youth groups from around the city, trying to bring in more diverse audiences into paddling, teaching safety, teaching paddling techniques. Uh, we have a number of groups that come back regularly, regularly to us. And one other service we've provided through the club, this is a ways ago, but during prohibition, the Washington Canoe Club was known as a good place to get a drink. So this is the um, uh, <laughs> a bootlegger by the name of Bill Snow pulling into the dock to unload, uh, unload uh, whatever was needed to keep us lubricated. The Canoe Club has been a great place for all kinds of celebrations. And one of the wonderful traditions is the uh, 4th of July fireworks. We all get in canoes and head down and watch, watch the fireworks over the Washington Monument. So uh, this is the Canoe Club, uh, the year of our birth, 1946, uh, sultry uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, this is the Canoe Club, as captured, as rendered by a child. I found this uh, in, a, in a pile in somebody's, one of somebody's boxes. Uh, it's sort of, to me, captures the magic and the mystery and the magnificence of, of our Washington, Washington Canoe Club. It's a place that has been, uh, it's a, you know, it's a place, but it's also a collection of people that have uh, enriched each other's lives and uh, enriched the lives of our city. Uh, a very, a very special place. And I, I've tried to capture some of the stories in my book about it. Um, this is where well, you've heard kind of a sampler of what's in the book. Um, um, you can contact me if you want to buy the book, or you can go to the Washington Canoe Club website and click donate, and then there's a drop down menu that says buy the book. Uh, if you mm -hmm. want to contribute uh, to the Boathouse Rehab, you can, you can do that as well. So that's, that's kind of it for tonight. I uh, hope uh, you learned a little and uh, hope you enjoyed it. So I'm happy to answer some questions. How long did it take you to write the book? Um, well, it took, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, if it's okay with people, I'm going to stop the screen share because I like seeing everybody's faces. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, Hilton, it took overall three years from when I made my original proposal till, um, till it was done. It was actually done last spring and, but then we postponed the release for six months because of COVID. Um, so uh, it was a, about a year, a year and a half of fairly intense work. Chris, what, what year did the club go co-educational and what's the gender breakdown at this point in time? The, uh, well, it was quote co-educational from the very start, Ed, but um, while we were pioneers in bringing women into paddling, we were very slow about allowing members, uh, women to be members. And even after we had Olympic medalists, they were not allowed to be members. 1969 was when we actually had women members. At this point, there's, I'd say, complete parity between men and women, both in terms of numbers. And if anything, the women are stronger in competitive circles than the men. Hmm. Well, that's kind of true of the Amherst athletic program. I mean, the women <laughs> really very well. That's, that's, that's. So Chris, I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, where the club is going, what its vision, and uh, you know what's on the, on their plate. Um, you illustrated that uh, it's not too structurally sound right now. So is the thing going to fall in, and uh, it's going to be over in a few years? You know what? What? Where are they headed, and what's their vision? Yeah. Well, we think we have a bright future, Jack. We we've got an architect who's developed design. Uh, concept designs, we're starting to work through the review process, which in Washington with a historic building, this building's on the National Register for Historic Places. So it's really a landmark and really well known. We're working through the review process. We're beginning our fundraising and we expect uh, to do in phases a complete restoration of, of, of the building over, but it's gonna be, truthfully, it's gonna take a decade or two to get it done. Uh, meanwhile, as I mentioned, we're, we're robust, we're active, we got a full membership, we're doing our uh, racing programs, we're training junior paddlers, we're bringing in diverse groups, we're working with the uh, uh, Wounded Warriors, so uh, the club is, is very much alive. 
That's very nice to hear, Chris. And a lot of the leaders, are they uh, from the younger generation as opposed to the oldsters so that you have that working in your favor too? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's really actually wonderful balance right now. Uh, we just had new board elections and uh, uh, balance of genders, balance of paddlers and so on. So yeah, we've got, you know, lots of, uh, lots of younger members. We, the former mayor of Washington, uh, uh, Anthony Williams just joined, which is, which is great in a couple of ways. Um, but we haven't, we haven't had a lot of luminaries, but we have, um, yeah, I, I, I'd say we've got a good balance, Jack. Hey, Chris, has, yeah. has the water quality changed in the Potomac during your, what, 40 years of involvement there? Who, who, who's that? I'm just looking who's this asking that Josh. question. Oh, Josh, Josh. Josh. Uh, yes, the water, you know, the water quality in the Potomac had a cycle where it got worse and worse. And in the 50s and 60s, it was described as an open sewer. Uh, yeah. With the passage of the Clean Water Act in 1970, it began getting cleaned up. And uh, I've been member 30 years. I, I can't say I personally can observe a change, but uh, certainly in terms of uh, health restrictions and advisories and so on, it's gotten uh, considerably better. And the, uh, the upstream treatment's gotten better. And there's a major project now in Washington to uh, um, uh, treat the uh, combined sewer overflows. So it's, you know, it's good. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to, I can't say for certain that uh, I can observe the change. That's good, Chris. Uh, Chris, how is, the, uh, how is the club supported financially? Well, we have, we ha we're all paid members, Steve, and uh, we have a, um, you know, small endowment, but it's basically uh, cash in, cash out. Although for the last four years, we've been big building up our ca cash reserves considerably um, to get ready for this, uh, for this uh, building restoration. Chris, one of the last slides that you had, uh, you showed a weekend scene at the club where there were lots of people, lots of boats. Uh, does that still exist on weekends or has that changed? Well, with COVID, uh, Ed, we, uh, we uh, have cut way back. We've had restrictions on how many people can be on the dock at one time and, uh, and really how many people can be there at all. But uh, it's changed. Uh, it's, it, there's more people now who come and paddle either for exercise or um, just for fun and then take off. So there, there, I think there are fewer big club activities like that one that you what, what, that you saw, um, but on on a on a nice weekend there'll be sixty people there, and we have some events where we have two hundred people there. Chris, it's it, incidentally incidentally with the COVID thing, ten minutes before I signed on this, uh, somebody wrote a note and said we just had our first COVID case at the canoe club. So I'm not sure what that's going to mean. I've been able to paddle three times a week there since March, which has just been a lifeline for me. Excuse mm -hmm. me, Gordon, you were going to ask. Well, I was just curious, in a social club in D.C., which is so politically focused, is there, well, how do I put it, do people interact without getting into political discussions, or does it get, <laughs> or does, does the group kind of divide between Democrats and Republicans and the twain never meet, or what? Uh, there's really a rule that politics doesn't get discussed. <laughs> it just... Um, <laughs> I mean, we know people more or less know others' affiliations, but one of the nice things about it, a lot of us don't know what other people at the club do. We're there to paddle, enjoy each other. So politics is rarely discussed. And when it is, it gets, as with everybody, very heated very quickly. <laughs> Chris, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Washington society and... <clears throat> until the 50s was uh, segregated. There were covenants in neighborhoods, <coughs> excuse me, in neighborhoods. Uh, was the membership, did they allow Jews and Afri African-Americans? And what date did that change? Do you know? Yeah, uh, Rich, that's really a, a, a good question. And something I don't have a good answer to. I mean, one, I mean, 
I don't, I've never heard anything about uh, anti-Jewish or covenants against Jewish members and early members almost certainly were Jewish. Um, in terms of segregation, we didn't have black members. And honestly, today we only have a couple of black members. We've got quite a number of Islanders. We've got people from Southeast Asia, Indians, Pakistanis, but really we, um, for whatever reasons, and you know, there are lots of rationalizations. We don't have black members. And uh, it's something where there's now a group of us who are working to increase the diversity of the club. Um, we've done these youth programs and so on, but it, it hasn't happened. And, and just to say, well, we've tried isn't sufficient from my point of view. So Chris, my, my brother lives in Georgetown <clears throat> and about 10 minutes into your talk, I sent him an email and called him uh, and, and he didn't respond. So is this a talk that you can you can pull up later and, and look at, or is this a Zoom? Uh, Jack, were you, Jack, are you recording it? I tried to record it. Um, I'm hoping it's recorded. And if it does, I'd be glad to share it, but. Uh, be great, thank you. But, but Glenn, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Glenn, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll let everyone know or let Chris okay. communicate. But Glenn, I'm doing five more of these book talks too for others, uh, other yep. groups. And if you send me his email, I'd be glad to get him invited. I mean, there each okay. one will be a little different. I'm doing one for the Historical Society of Washington, which is going to emphasize more about neighborhoods and the so social uh, issues and architecture and some things. But um, uh, then I'm doing one for. Uh, you know, a big paddling group. So each, each one will differ a little bit. So if you send me his email, I can correspond with him about what he might be most interested in. Okay, thanks. Jack, Jack uh, up in our upper left corner of the screen, the recording blinking red light is on. So it looks like it's recording. Well, you know more than I do. So <laughs> <laughs> glad to hear that. So Chris, one of the things I would think you could potentially use this for if the show goes on the road locally would be to you know, attract a, a more diverse group. Um, I think what you have to say um, is quite interesting and you, know, you can certainly slant it in a way that um, maybe you would get some, some new members that are more Jack, diverse. Jack, that, thank you for saying that. That's, I hadn't thought of that. I'm not looking for more work right now, but um, I am very interested in the uh, diversity part of this. And I, I hadn't thought of doing, trying to do that. And uh, there are certainly venues and places I could, I'm sure I get, could get invited and, and do some recruiting. That's a great I idea. I mean, as a former elementary school teacher yourself, that is, you know, I would think you'd have a heyday with some of the kids in grade school and maybe junior high, and maybe even the high schoolers. And uh, when the kids come to the club, they, you know, they just love it. They, I mean, it's a special place. It's, I mean, part of it's geographic that, that, you know, we're not in a part of the city that's diverse. So it's a, it's a, you know, people have to be bused to, over to, uh, sure. and so on. But, but um, it's certainly something <clears throat> that can be worked through. So Chris, I would try to get my brother to join, but <clears throat> he's an old white guy and he's Amherst 65. <laughs> And it wouldn't what, help. What, what does that mean? He doesn't know how to use a computer? <laughs> <laughs> Mary's computer just went dead. So, oh, shit. Uh oh. Uh oh. Shit. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What is that? <laughs> We're going to start uh -oh. over again. Chris, I can still see you. Okay. Well, my screen just went blank. Oh, oh yeah. you got the show on. You got the, the, maybe, uh, somebody's trying, maybe somebody's trying to tell us something. You need to stop sharing the screen. Uh, Let's see. Hmm. Hey, Chris, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'll talk to you about it. Yeah, uh, good. Well, uh, Jack, since I'm blacked out here, I don't know what happened. I tried to move the computer. <laughs> maybe we should wind up. I've had this experience myself. And I give you all hugs. Chris. I, I, at Georgetown. Chris, I enjoyed it. I'll talk to you. Good, Dana. That sounds great. All right. Thank you much, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, great Chris, Chris. Good job to you, everybody. This has been great, Chris. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Chris.
Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for thank you for getting everyone involved, Chris. It's great seeing everyone on Zoom. Thanks yeah. a lot. Sure, right. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Thank you, Jack. Uh, go to the football game.